grief-stricken world. One of these days we get to stare into the face of our Savior and all will be made right in this world. We're so glad that you have come here this morning, whether you are a church member who regularly attends, whether you are visiting, whether you're watching online. We're so thankful and, uh, that you're here, and we just want you to know that God loves you. <laughs> we want you to know that Christ died for you. We want you to know that Jesus desires more for you than you could possibly ever think or imagine. And it's always our goal here is to exalt Christ so we can see him high and lifted up. So thank you. I want to encourage you to continue to pray for your ones as we're in our Who's Your One campaign. We're praying for, we're serving, we're loving our ones, trying to share the gospel with our ones. But also this is helping us to become evangelistic in everything we do. Uh, to look for the ways, to look for the people, the situation that God places in our lives and in our midst that we may share the gospel with them. I was in Atlanta Monday and Tuesday uh, for a church conference and uh, on the way to the airport, back to the airport, Atlanta, and I was riding with this gentleman named Richard, and we were in a Prius, and I wasn't too happy about that because I don't fit well in the back of a Prius. But, you know, there are worse things in this life, right? And uh, we, I got to talking and sharing with Richard, and we were chit-chatting, and I, I said, Richard, you got any religious leanings? He goes, oh, no, 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 no. He says, uh, I, he says I'm anti-organizational religion. I said, me too. I <laughs> He's what? And it was weird because I'd already told him I'm a preacher. <laughs> and so he just looked real weird at me in the mirror. And, uh, and we got to talking, and I asked him, you know, what he thought about Jesus, and he didn't say much. And I said, well, I'm a, let me tell you I said, why I've chosen to follow Jesus. And I just laid out the reliability and the validity of the New Testament and the gospel specifically. And I said, if those are true, which I think they're true, by any standard measure, if historical, academic data, they're absolutely true. I said, then I'm going to have to deal with those truth claims, Richard, and you will too. I said, and for me, I had to accept that Jesus was the one and only Son of God, and I had to give my life to him. And that's where it was. Richard wasn't into the whole, you know, sinner's prayer thing, but I just wanted to give Richard something that he could hold on to from the Gospels. And it's just looking for those everyday opportunities that God gives us. And I just want to encourage you. And I'm so excited. I am encouraged by you because weekly you're sending me texts and emails and messages telling me, showing me, letting me know. And I'm being encouraged by your faithfulness of how God is doing that. And I love that he's creating this culture amongst us where we're being these lights in the darkness. Amen. This, this life in a dead world. It's just absolutely wonderful. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to ask you to turn. We're going to turn to two different passages this morning. Put a, uh, open your Bible to Matthew 27 and then put a finger on Luke 23. We're going to be going from Matthew 27 to Luke 23 to get a full picture of what we're dealing this morning. And we want to talk about an example in forgiveness this morning. An example in forgiveness this morning. And I was thinking about this uh, a story, a thing popped in my head that happened in our house a few weeks ago. The other day, Jackson was watching a TV show, and he had to go do something. His mama told him to do something, and I was like, good, I'm going to watch me a show. Well, Jackson hid the remote from me. <laughs> I couldn't find it. And he wouldn't tell me where it was at. And I was getting, like, furious. I'm like, look, son, I paid for this TV. I want to watch what I want to watch. I paid for the subscriptions on this TV. He's like, no, Dad, I'm finishing my show. Then you can watch what you want to watch. Hey. You know what? It'd be like this sometimes. I just waited patiently for my, for my moment. He has this hoverboard, which I despise. Rides it all around the house, in the yard. What I hate about it is he gets on the edge of my living room rug, and he just goes back and forth on the lip of the rug. It just makes a do-do, do-do, do-do sound. And I hate it. it. It grinds my soul, you know. So he, he was in the basement doing something, and so I took his hoverboard, and I hit it. Now, to be fair, I didn't hide it like an evil genius. I hid it. I put it back in the box it came in and put it in his closet. <laughs> he looked for over a week for that hoverboard. <laughs> Never found it. And, and he was just begging me one day, one night, you know, where's my hoverboard? I said, I'm not going to tell you where your hoverboard is. I said, this is how the game's played, so you need to realize when you mess with the master, you're going to learn a lesson. <laughs> and finally, Kristen said, Jackson, it's in your closet. And I was like, what? How you betray me like this, girl? 
But that's how it is, isn't it? Somebody gets us, we want to get them back, don't we? Somebody messes with us, we want to mess with them back. And this is just fun. He and I play like this, do silly stuff like that all the time. But in the larger grand scheme of things, that's our life is like that a lot. The world we live in, the people we encounter, the lies, the cheating, the distrust, the gossip, the backbiting, the selfishness, they don't give us much cause to want to forgive people, does it? Most of the time when we're wrong, if we're honest, most of the time when we're wrong, our anger wells up inside of us because our pride was challenged or our trust was broken. And then what happens if we're just going to lay the cards on the table, we start developing this plan, not necessarily an evil genius plan, but we start developing this plan in our head. Whether we act or not, the thoughts usually come how to get back or get even with the person that wronged us. Some of us harbor for years anger and hate and bitterness, letting it grow inside us like a cancerous tumor and taking over us until we can't function for Christ. I've seen unforgiveness cause individuals to have physical and emotional, relational, mental, and definitely spiritual problems. I've seen unforgiveness cause people to do some of the most horrendous acts you could imagine. The inability for you and I to grant genuine forgiveness is killing us. The inability, and this, when, we, when I say this, I'm not just talking about the lost world. I'm talking about it being prevalent in the church as well. Now, when I say that, I'm not referencing anything specific in our church. But the church, I know this, the family of God, they will never, the church will never experience true revival we will never have a pouring out of the Spirit of God as long as those in the body harbor unforgiveness towards one another. Last week, we discussed the trials and the betrayal of Jesus. We saw that Jesus, as he faced different people and groups and circumstances, how the reactions varied from group to group and person to person. We asked some very pointed questions to place ourselves in, in these scenarios and make us think hard how we react to Jesus under various circumstances. Today, I want us to follow Jesus from the pronouncement of his punishment from Pilate to the beating to the actual crucifixion. Today, we're going to notice how even in the midst of these insults and blasphemies and torture that Jesus provides for you and I two things. A model of how we can be forgiven and a model of how we can forgive others. I want us to seriously consider our actions in light of Jesus' actions. He willingly, knowingly, intentionally forgave the very people who conspired against him, who lied on him, who betrayed him, who cowered away from him, who took the flesh from his bones, who spilled the blood from his brow, who drove the nails into his hands, and he hung him on a cross to die, willingly forgave. Can we honestly convince ourselves that we ever have the right to harbor unforgiveness, our bitterness, our anger, our hatred towards anyone, knowing the example that Jesus has set for us? As we go on this path with our Savior today, I, I want us to see that Jesus, what he underwent, was not only for the forgiveness of those he liked, but it was for forgiveness of those who hated him. It was for the forgiveness of you and I this morning. Christ died for your sins, and he died for my sins. He died, listen to this, for your envy. He died for your anger. He died for your greed. He died for our lusts and our vulgar speech. He, he died for the times we chose the world instead of him. And he died for that. Thinking of Jesus' example this morning, I want us to think in our minds, is there a person in our lives who has wronged us that we have not forgiven? What reason do we have for not forgiving them? As valid as a reason as you have, is it more valid than the reason Jesus chose to forgive those who killed him? Do we have the right to harbor bitterness and unforgiveness knowing what Jesus did for us? 
And for the person here this morning, yes, this is a weighty sermon. These are, these are heavy verses. But I want to ask you, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, you've never asked Him to forgive you of your sins, you've never placed your faith or trust in Him, I want you this morning to vividly see what He has done for you. I want you to know His love. I want you to feel His grace. I want you to gravitate towards His mercy. Father God, would you, in the name of your Spirit, would you speak to us by the power of your Word for our good and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scourged and beaten. When we last left Jesus, he had been returned to Pilate by Herod. Now Pilate is going to present Christ along with Barabbas to the crowd. And this is the scene that we have now. Starting in verse 26 of Matthew 27. Then he released Barabbas for them. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after having twisted together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him. They took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him. And led him away to crucify him. As they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, who they pressed into service to bear his cross. The familiarity with which we read these verses robs us often of the weight of the verses. It's imperative for us to keep a proper understanding and a constant remembrance of what Jesus, our Savior, endured for us. Just as Pilate releases Barabbas, he has Jesus scourged, or your translation may say flogged. Now remember, up to this point, Jesus had already been physically beaten. He'd already been ridiculed, and he'd already been mocked by the Jewish courts. Now he will undergo even worse treatment, uh, undergo a more uh, inhumane torture by the Romans. This scourging, we read over it, is just simply, he was scourged by the Romans. But that is an elementary reading of the text. When we have a scourging, we have to understand that the scourging was taking place. The shirt was removed from the prisoner. And there was this large stone placed in the middle of the praetorium. And, 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 and the, victim was, uh, the prisoner was laid over it, and their arms wrapped around it and tied together tightly. So the flesh of the back is as tight as possible. And then the Roman guard, he takes this, this leather tool. It's a, it's a leather handle. It has several leather strands on it. It has bone and glass and metal within it on the tips. And as the prisoner is laid across there, he's given 39 lashes. 13 across the middle of the back. 13 over the right shoulder and side. And 13 over the left shoulder and side. Oftentimes... Individuals did not survive the scourging. Most times, they were unconscious by the end of it. The scourging was designed to literally remove the flesh from the body. And you can imagine with me in your head as you're watching this, as we're an audience here at this, this, this place watching Jesus, the one who's never wronged a single person. And this is not even the worst because the cross is yet to come. He spread a cross here and with each lash, it doesn't just do like a belt and slide across the backside. Each lash comes and it grabs a hold of flesh and on the swing, the backswing, the flesh is removed from the bones, blood gushing. At the end of this, it would leave Jesus, his back, just one open, raw mash of, of quivering flesh and gushing blood. And as if that was not enough, when he was finished, barely conscious, he was taken to the praetorium, which was Herod the Great's palace, 
that the Roman governors used while in Jerusalem. And that bleeding, that barely able to stand Jesus, he is continuing to be mocked by these soldiers. And what is so ironic about this scene, they put this scarlet robe on him. They take this crown of thorns and they press it upon his brow. Could you imagine? I don't know if you've ever been in the woods and you, you've run across, you've been hog hunting and, and run through those big thorn briar bushes. They ain't fun. And they push that upon his head. They take a reed which symbolizes the king's scepter and they place it in his hand and they begin to say, oh, hell, Jesus, king of the Jews. And they did this in order to mock him. But what they didn't realize is that one day there's going to come a day when they will be on their hands and knees and they will look up to Jesus in his reign, in his glory, in his temple. And they will shout, praise be to Jesus. Verse 30 declares that even after all the pain and the suffering, they come together and they're not done. And this is simply a fulfillment of the prophecy of Micah 5, 1. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. Imagine with me, if you will. Exhausted from a sleepless night. Heartbroken by seeing his followers scatter. Blown away at the crowd that he healed and he fed and he loved and he showed compassion, desired a murderer to be free over him. Broken by his scourging and multiple beatings, he's given a cross to carry. You imagine how weak his legs are. His back couldn't take the air touching it and he has this being laid across him to carry. He is like us. He can't carry it. He falls. He can't continue. There's not another step he could take. All his energy is spent. Jesus lay on that Via Della Rosa, bleeding, quivering, gasping for breath. And he hasn't even endured the wrath of our sin yet. The Roman guards order Simon, more than likely a Jew coming from North Africa, to partake in the Passover. They stop him to carry the cross for Jesus. And as we examine this wretched episode in the life of Jesus, we are to know a few things, to sit with a few things. Beloved, I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that in the middle of this pain that Jesus loved you. That Jesus was thinking of you. Because he still had to endure. He still had to go through. Every lash was yet to be the wrath of the holy and righteous Father upon him for your sin and my sin. He loved us. He bore the pain. He bore the humiliation in order to get to the cross, to endure the wrath, to take the pain, to take the punishment of the Father. He could have given up. He could have died on that scourging pillar, but he knew he had to undergo the cross. The second thing I think we should know is that the Father gave Jesus the strength and the courage to endure such horrible inhumane tragedies. And you know what? The Word of God promises that He will give us the same strength and courage to endure all things. Remember, when you're in a trial, church, when sin has you down and you feel like you can't take another step, when you're ready to give up because you're tired of failing over and over and over, when you feel like everything has just pushed you and you're small as an ant, I want you to remember that God has never left you, nor will he ever forsake you. Whatever you're going through in this life, God is there for you. He has your best in mind. You may not see it at the time. It may be impossible. But as we give Jesus our hearts, as we give him our all, he will start to work on us. And I'm not promising overnight fixes. Please don't misunderstand. Most of our issues didn't start overnight, did they? 
But I'm promising you that God will do this. He will come. He will save. He will restore. He will redeem. He will empower you by his spirit. And that he will walk side by side, step by step with you on the journey. And church, know this. Believer, know this. That just as Simon was called to carry the cross of Jesus when he could no longer endure, we are called to come alongside our brothers and sisters in their pain and their brokenness and help them bear their burdens as well. The next episode, crucified. Verse 33 of Matthew 27. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when he had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And above his head, they hung up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. They arrived at the hill of Calvary called Golgotha, more than likely at the city gate, so that Every punishment, every death, every crucifixion, every moment would be as public as possible to tell everyone, don't mess with Rome. Verse 34 tells us they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh to drink. Women, what happened, women in Jerusalem would prepare this mixture for anybody undergoing crucifixion. And it was a mixture given to them in mercy. The women made it so that it would dull the pain, it would dull the nerves, it would act as a sedative almost. Jesus tasted it, recognizing what it was. He wanted to be fully conscious for every moment of pain. The text tells us the Roman guards divided up his clothing. The Jewish male wore five articles of clothing, the inner robe, the outer robe, the sandals, the girdle, and the tunic. And they didn't know it, but as they sat there casting lots for the clothes of the Savior of the world, they're fulfilling Psalm twenty-two, eighteen, 18, which reads... They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Mark 15, 25 tells us that they crucified him during the third hour, which was 9 o'clock. And none of the gospel writers give us much detail of what a crucifixion looked like because they didn't have to give a detailed description because their readers understood just how graphic, just how horrendous a crucifixion was. Sometimes the upright beam was already in the ground, and they would nail the prisoner to the cross beam and then with ropes hoist him up. That's not the picture we have of Jesus. It, more than likely, Jesus was laid down with a cross beam across the vertical pole, and his hands and his feet were nailed to the cross. Imagine with me for a moment. We often read over that. We say that like it's just a, a quip of the tongue. His hands and feet were nailed to the cross. Look at your hands right now. Think about your ankles. What would it look like to have the bones in them shattered because of a nail going through there? What would it feel like for your back, which is an open mass of flesh and bone, every nerve ending there being laid across this, this unsanded, this unfinished piece of wood and hoisted into a hole and then dropped down? I don't know if I like how we commercialize the cross so much. We'll go in Zales and we'll buy a pretty cross necklace or we'll get some cross earrings and put them on our body. It makes us feel good to tell people we love Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the cross we wear is pretty. It's shiny. It's usually in gold or silver, isn't it? If it's dirty, we pay somebody to clean it. If it's broke, we pay somebody to fix it. But that's not the picture of the cross as we see in the Bible, is it? picture of the cross in the Bible is one of shame and disdain. It's gruesome and it's ugly. From medical staff, historical writings, and archaeological excavations, we've been able to get a good understanding of what took place during the crucifixion. Frederick Ferrara describes crucifixion in this way. A death by crucifixion seems to include all that pain and death can have of the horrible and ghastly. Dizziness, cramps, Thirst, starvation, sleeplessness, 
traumatic fever, shame, long torment, all intensified just up to the point at which they can be endured at all, but all stopping just short of the point which would give the sufferer the relief of unconsciousness. The unnatural position made every movement painful. The lacerated veins and crushed tendons throbbed with incessant anguish. The wounds, inflamed by exposure, gradually gained green. The swollen arteries, especially at the head and the stomach, became swollen and oppressed with a surcharge of blood. And while each varied of misery went on, they gradually increased. There was added to them the intolerable pain of a burning and a raging thirst which could not be satisfied. And all these physical complications caused an internal excitement and anxiety which made the prospect of death itself seem delicious and an exquisite release. One thing is clear. First century executions were not like modern ones for they did not seek a quick, painless death, nor did they seek to preserve the dignity and integrity of the person. On the contrary, they, th- they sought an agonizing torment which completely humiliated the criminal. And it's important for us to understand as I go into such detail because we need to understand what Jesus endured for us. And this is not even the spiritual pain yet. We're going to talk about that next week. I want us to think hard this morning. I want us to sit with the weight knowing what Jesus voluntarily went through for every single one of us. Did he deserve that? No. Do we deserve what he went through for us? Do we deserve the gift he offers? Are we worthy of this gift? Go ahead and tell you right now, we are not. We are not deserving. We are not worthy. Not any of us. Certainly not me. Not a person on this earth ever has been or ever will be. And the beauty is that this is the mystery of God's love for us, church. We are the ones who are supposed to be dead. We are the ones to endure torment. We are the ones that should have God's wrath upon us. But Jesus said no I'll take it in their stead, Father. We are more guilty than the worst murderer that we could think of. But God, because of his wondrous love for us, he allowed Jesus to take our place. Church, the crucifixion of Jesus was a voluntary display of the enormity of his love for us. And Jesus voluntarily went through all that so that you and I right here may know what love is. What true love is. We may know what life is. We may embrace peace and joy. We may experience heaven for all eternity. The next episode. Forgiveness in the midst of murder. True forgiveness, when granted, is accepted as a warm embrace displaying unwarranted grace to the offender, freeing them of guilt and shame of sin, and beautifully restoring them to the offended party. One of the most powerful displays of forgiveness comes in a prayer that I read as was uncovered from the horrors of Ravensbrück concentration camp. Ravensbrück was a concentration camp built in 1939 for women. Over 90,000 women and children perished there, murdered by the Nazis. Corey Ten Boone, in her book, The Hiding Place, says she recollects that she was there. And this prayer that I'm about to read was found in the clothing of a dead child. O oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but also those of ill will. But do not remember all of the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Instead, remember the fruits we have borne because of this suffering. Our fellowship, our loyalty to one another, our humility, our courage, our generosity. The greatness of heart that has grown from this trouble. And when our persecutors come to be judged by you, let all of these fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. 
I know that you will not always be in the best and easiest of circumstances to offer forgiveness. I know that. Many times you're going to have to forgive your spouse who wronged you in the most horrific of ways. Many times you're going to have to forgive your parents for not raising you the way that a loving parent should raise a child. Many times you're going to have to forgive a kid for abandoning the faith that they grew up with. You're going to have to forgive coworkers for backstabbing you. You're going to have to forgive exes. You're going to have to forgive people who hate you even when you don't deserve it. But isn't that the meaning of forgiveness? We freely give it when it's not deserved. Even after being beat and scourged, after being beat some more, mocked and ridiculed and hung upon a cross, Luke now paints for us a picture in chapter 23. Listen to what he says in chapter 23, verse 34. But Jesus was saying, Oh, church, (laughs) Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. How easily those words came off his lips. How hard it is it for us to utter such a thing. Most of the time, our forgiveness is like the little girl who was being punished and she had to eat alone in the corner of the dining room. The family paid no attention to her until she made the prayer. This is like our prayers, this little girl. She said, I thank thee, Lord, for preparing a table before me in the presence of my enemies. (laughs) We do that, don't we? But is passive-aggressive forgiveness really forgiveness? Is it really mirroring the heart of Jesus towards a broken sinner? Is it really following the model and example that Christ has laid for us and given to us? When I think of Jesus' forgiveness, not just to my sin, but to the very people that participate in the execution, I am put to shame. How slow I am to forgive sometimes. How oftentimes I try to rationalize not forgiving. Or how many times do I piece my forgiveness out? If they do this, then I'll forgive this, right? And all of this, Jesus taught us a great lesson. The gift of forgiveness is a precious treasure that should never be taken lightly. Even before his death, Jesus had pity and sympathy and care for the very ones who were responsible for his death. The Jewish leaders who thought him a heretic. The fickle crowd who swayed to and fro. Pilate who condemned him to die. The Roman guards who scourged and mocked him and nailed him to the cross. For the believer, you can ask ourselves, can we ever justify not forgiving someone, no matter the depth of the cut, knowing what Jesus has done for us? He set the bar for us, church. We can never withhold forgiveness, knowing that we have been forgiven. We can never withhold forgiveness, knowing that Jesus forgave the very ones who murdered him. Let me ask you a very pointed question this morning, church. We need to sit with for a moment. Is there bitterness in your heart towards someone this morning? Is there malice? Are you harboring anger and hatred? Maybe you're justified in every moment in every ounce of the way you feel. But when compared to Jesus, do we have a right to feel that way? Do we have a right to withhold forgiveness? I'm not saying the relationship is going to be restored, but do we have the right on our end, on the offended party, on the one who's been hurt, after knowing what Jesus has done, do we have the right Would you follow Jesus' example this morning? 
Would you in your heart right now forgive those who have harmed you or hurt you? You may be the person here who needs to experience forgiveness. You may be here and you think there's no way God can forgive me. My sins are too great. You know what? Your sins are great. They are horrible. I want to tell you something. Maybe as a preacher, somebody I wanted to get you to come back to church, I probably shouldn't tell you. You're a very wicked person. You're worthy of death and hell. But I want to tell you something. Just as little Joe Lee gave an example of what God did in her heart as she was baptized and brought from death to life, so you can be too. So you can be too. There's forgiveness in the midst of murder, but we also find salvation in the midst of murder. Look at Luke 23, 39. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God? Since you're under the same sentence of condemnation. Notice this man's insight into his own sin and to who was hung next to him. Verse 41. We indeed are suffering justly, every one of us, Suffer justly for our sins. But he says, we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. He knew it. We try to cover our sins up, but he knew it. But this man has done nothing wrong. He said, this man's sinless. Look at verse 42. Oh, how much I love verse 42. And as he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom in Jesus' response to anyone who places their faith into him, he says, truly I say to you, you shall be with me today in paradise. Two criminals were crucified with Jesus. One was right and one was left. One believed in Christ and was saved that very day. The other participated in insults and he received his just punishment not only then but for all eternity. These men were more than likely collaborators with Barabbas who was previously released guilty of insurrection and murder. These two men demonstrate a truth that is all too real. Individuals, people can encounter the same truths about Christ, the same grace and the same mercy, the same forgiveness, and yet respond differently. The first man wanted Jesus because of what he could do for him. He wanted to get out of his just punishment. The second man knew he was guilty and just asked Jesus to forgive him. We don't have to try to justify our position Beloved, we don't have to try to make ourselves right. We don't have to play the God, I did this, but I also did this. I'm not that bad. Just come. You just come to Jesus. And all of what sin does and the ugliness and the wretchedness, we just come and like this criminal on the cross, we just say, Jesus, forgive me. And notice what happens. Immediately he's granted eternal life. What about you? What kind of person are you this morning? Are you willing to accept Jesus at his word? Or do you find yourselves always making excuses as to why you can't accept and follow Christ? If we choose to give excuses, we can expect nothing from Jesus. But if we accept him as he is, Savior and Lord, we're granted eternal life. I want you to listen right now. No matter your sin, no matter your guilt, no matter your life, no matter what you've done, if you respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life today, right now you can experience a new birth in Jesus. Take an example from the little boy. He just got saved and he sat on the front row next to this old man who looked real upset. And the little boy looked to the the man and said, Sir, do you need to get saved? The man startled and he said abruptly, I tell you, son, I've been a deacon in this church for 30 years and chairman of the deacons for 15. And the little boy just said, sir, it didn't, it didn't matter what you've done. Jesus loves you and he can save you. <laughs> and just like the thief on the cross, you could be granted forgiveness. It doesn't matter how long you've been a member here. 
It doesn't matter how long your name's been on church row. I've genuinely seen deacons get saved. You don't need to be embarrassed. It doesn't matter what role you have here. It doesn't matter who your grandma is. If you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I promise you, it doesn't matter what your status in the community is. You give your heart today, every one of us with all the angels in the heavens will shout hallelujah. Many times, you know, even as Christians, as disciples, we make up excuses as to why we can't follow Jesus' commands. We treat Jesus like the toy at the bottom of the cereal box. If we don't get down to it, if somebody takes it from us, we get all mad, don't we? But the question remains, will we accept Jesus at his word? Will we allow his forgiveness to be applied to our hearts? Will we follow the model he has set before us? Church, the tender embrace of Christ's forgiveness is a soothing balm to a heart wounded by sin. And if you're here today and you need to forgive someone, you need to release someone from a prison that you've put both yourselves in, would you be willing to do that? Don't go through life any longer bearing the heavy burden of unforgiveness. May we follow the example of Christ and freely forgive. No conditions, no strings, no expectation of return. Just forgive. If you're here today, you've never confessed Jesus as Savior. You've never repented of your sins. You've not been set free from the bonds of sin. I want to let you know there's good news today. Today you can give your heart to Christ. Today you can be made new. Today you can leave the world behind with its vices and curses and walk out of here a member of the family of God. Would you be willing to come to new life today? Would you be willing to accept the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life right now? Would you come? Let us stand, please. As Brother James and his team comes, I want to let you know that the altar is open this morning if you're in need of prayer. You don't have to come up, but I want to let you know if you do, it's okay. Maybe you want to give your heart to Christ today. I implore you to do so. Maybe you want to follow Joe Lee's example and, and follow through in believer's baptism. You can do that today. Maybe you want to start the process of becoming a member at our church family here, our family of faith. You can do that. Maybe you're here and you need to make the most important decision of your life, and that's to give your life to Jesus. You can do that today. And you can make all those decisions right there in your chair. You can come up here and just pray. I'd be honored to pray with you. But let us not leave the weight of the biblical record of Jesus' model and example and extension of forgiveness sitting here. May we deal with that this morning. May we wrestle with that truth this morning. I'm going to pray. And if you're here today and you need to make a decision, any one of those decisions, you're free to do so. I'm going to pray, and as we sing, would you respond? Father God, thank you so much for your holy word this morning. It convicts our heart in such a a deep level. Thank you, God, for offering forgiveness to the unworthy, to the undeserving. Oh, Lord, we say thank you. God, would you help us to know that forgiveness today? For the man, for the woman, for the child who's never experienced it, would you help them know that today? That they would place their faith in you. For the person here who has been battling and holding on to unforgiveness, would you free them from that and would you release them from that prison as they... Walk in Christ's example today. 
that you would remind them, remind them deeply of the level of forgiveness that they have experienced from you.